Good evening, everybody. Um, can you hear me? I think so. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So a warm welcome to those of you here in the Charles Wilson Lecture Theatre in Glasgow University and to those on Zoom uh, to this British Academy lecture organised in partnership with the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow. My name is Colin Miller and I'm in the Council of the RPSG and I'll be chairing tonight's meeting. The talk will take about 45 minutes, followed by a five minute break and then the question and answer session. If you want to ask a question via Zoom, please use the Zoom Q&A box. Please state your question as concisely as possible, please. And could I also ask those of you in the audience to mute any electronic bits of kit that you have. Thank you. After the Q&A session, refreshments will be served outside the, just outside the lecture th theater. I'm delighted to say that this hopefully signals a return to our pre-COVID normal practice. Um, a little bit about the British Academy. It was founded in 1902, and it is the UK's National Academy for the Humanities and Social Sciences. They mobilize these disciplines to understand the world and shape a brighter future. They do this by investing currently about 25 million pounds per year in researchers and projects around the UK and overseas, engaging the public with fresh thinking and debates, bringing together scholars, government, business and civil society to influence policy for everyone's benefit. The RPSG was founded in 1802 to study, to aid the study, diffusion and advancement of the arts and sciences with their applications and the better understanding of public affairs. This is done by holding 12 fortnightly lectures from about middle of October to the beginning of April. We have wonderful speakers who are expert in their fields. Lectures are open to the RPSG members and to the general public. Tonight's event forms part of the British Academy Lecture Series, which was established in 1908. We are thrilled to welcome Professor Patricia Finlay to continue this series of lectures. So our wonderful speaker tonight is Professor Finlay. She's appointed as Professor of Work and Employment Relations at Strathclyde University Business School in 2010 and is now a distinguished professor there. Her current research focuses on job quality, workplace innovation, productivity, and well-being. She is co-chair of Scotland's Fair Work Convention, having been the convention's academic advisor since its inception. She also sits on an absolutely enormous, huge raft of other national and international work and employment related committees editorial boards, and also on the British University's Industrial Relations Association, just to name a few. Professor Finlay's lecture tonight is entitled, Fair Work for the Future? Question mark at the end. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Finlay. Thank you very much, Colin, for the kind introduction and thank you to the Society and the British Academy for inviting me along here this evening um, and for the audience, of course, joining us in person or online. This is my first time in a lecture theatre for two years, so it's a slightly novel experience for an academic uh, who used to spend a lot of time in lecture theatres. As Colin has said, what I want to do tonight is to reflect a little bit on the contemporary world of work and to, to, to make the case that that work, paid work and good quality work really matters, 
to talk about the benefits of what that work can bring and to think about the challenges in trying to embed and deliver fair work here in Scotland and beyond. And I'll draw uh, on the various um, roles that I have, as Colin has indicated. So I'll draw on research that my own team and, and par research partners have done over the last decade or so. Um, and I'll draw on my own experience as the, um, the co-chair of Scotland's Fair Work Convention. And there's a lot of crossover between those two roles because, of course, the convention draws very heavily on research. It's an evidence-based process. So the arguments for fair work in Scotland are very well steeped in good, reliable social science evidence. And there's a lot of overlap between the, the convention's framework and the kinds of work that my, myself and my own team do. So what I do really is I've spent my career researching the world of work. I spend my days thinking about what people like you do all day and every day. And some of that involves doing very specific things about what's the implications of a particular workplace practice, what effect does it have on people's experience of work. Some of it looks at the configurations of business choices in sectors and industries and what that means for the quality of people's work. And some of it is around what does government do? How does government create policy and legislation that changes what work looks like and that improves what, what, what work is? And one of the things I wanted to stress is, is that the kind of job I do shows how much work is both an ordinary and an extraordinary part of our life. It's ordinary because we do it all the time. We spend most of our days of the week at work. We spend most of our ye adult years at work more than we spend in education, for many people, more than they spend in retirement. So work is a constant feature of our life. And in that sense, it's predictable and routine, and for many people, a little bit mundane. But in actual fact, work is extraordinary in the impact that it has on our life, on our health and well-being, on our prosperity and the prosperity of our families and communities, on the goods and services that are available for the, for the public, on the provision of public services, on the economy and on the wider society. So work has a really extraordinary role in our life. And that's really where I think I want to start this evening's discussion. How we spend our days is how we spend our lives and we spend most of our days at work. There's a variety of estimates of how long we spend at work, but one of those estimates suggests we spend upwards of 90,000 hours in our life in paid work. Perhaps a more catchy one is that we spend, as you'll see from the lyrics, news, newly resurrected in a car ad on television. Um, we might spend eight hours of our day at work, eight hours at play and eight hours asleep. I'm not sure how accurate that estimate is. It certainly doesn't take into account paid, unpaid work. It doesn't take into account all of the work that goes into cooking, cleaning, household maintenance, childcare, child reading and other caring responsibilities. But just like the authors of the lyrics, Lucky Me, I'm also not going to focus on unpaid work this evening. I'm going to focus very particularly on paid work. But bearing in mind that paid work is inextricably connected to unpaid work. So the shape of women's jobs, the shape of women's careers are very much affected by the parameters that are imposed by, um, by their engagement disproportionately in unpaid work. And that has huge implications for women's job quality. So specifically tonight, I want to focus not just on paid work, which is very important, but I want to focus on high quality work. And I'm going to argue that that should be an important aspiration for employers. It should be an important priority for, for policymakers, and it should be of significant concern to all of us as citizens, because paid work matters a great deal to all of us. It's a very interesting time to talk about work. Because of course we've just we're, we're we're at the end of two years of a pandemic which has disrupted heavily the world of work. We are at the beginning um, of a cost of living crisis, which looks like it will be very significant. The new statesman referred to it as a, a dystopian combination of higher prices, lower real wages, and higher taxes. And we sit at a time when average real wages have fallen below below the level that they sat at at 2008 before the global financial crisis. So it's a good time uh, to be looking at the world of work. We know a lot about how good paid work is for, is for us from the absence of paid work. So a very robust body of research and insight about unemployment. 
We know that people who are unemployed have um, much poorer mental and physical health. It affects their morbidity and their mortality. We know that it affects the structure of their day. It denies them social contact. It denies them the opportunities to use their talents. It denies them the opportunities and the resources to be able to achieve various things in their life. So we know a lot about why good work is, is good for it, why work is good for us, because we know that not having work isn't good for us. But interestingly, recent research has suggested that work is not always good for us, depending on its quality. So there's been some work um, carried out by uh, Chandola and Zhang in 2017, and they were interested in what happened to unemployed people who transitioned into different types of work. And following a population sample in the UK, they found that adults who transitioned from unemployment into poor work were, had poorer health and stress biomarkers than adults who stayed unemployed. So in some circumstances, paid work is not good for us. What matters, of course, is the quality of that work. And that's something that social science has, has, has recognised and researched for a very long time. The, the quality of work, the importance of the quality of work has been recognised since the 1950s and 60s, or 60s and 70s with the quality of working life movement. But thereafter, from about the mid 1970s on, the quality of work fell off of the agenda of many academics and indeed of policymakers. And one of the reasons that that happened is that the oil crisis and the associated economic shock and job loss of the mid 70s meant that a focus was placed much more heavily on the ability to have any job and not just a good job. And interestingly, some 50 years later, that focus of any job being better than, than, than no job at all is still an important part of public policy. But I'm going to argue that actually that's something that, that, that is really quite problematic. More recently, we've seen a resurgence in interest in the quality of work from about the 2000s onwards in, in terms of academic work and maybe a little bit later around policy. It's worth saying, of course, that the ILO, the International Labour Organization, has long had a commitment to what they call decent work. And bodies such as the EU and the OECD have followed on with strong policy commitments over recent years to the importance of job quality as a driver of inclusive economic growth and more sustainable economic activity. So that resurgence has led to a number of questions about what constitutes good quality work, how can we measure it, but crucially, how can we intervene to try to deliver it? A very quick um, discussion about, about defining and measuring job quality. So there isn't a, a standard definition of what job quality is in the UK or indeed internationally. There's no one accepted definition. Some people use single indicators to try and measure job quality. Other and, and those indicators are often um, exhibit a disciplinary preference. So economists might use pay as a proxy measure of what job quality is. Uh, social psychologists might use job satisfaction as a proxy measure, and scholars who are from a more sociological tradition might use control of work or task discretion as their insight into what job quality looks like. Some of those measures are objective, so what you're paid or the number of hours you work is an objective measure. Your job satisfaction or your autonomy at work are not objective, those are subjective measures. And that can create complications when different data sources point in different directions. So hairdressers often have very high levels of job satisfaction, but on any other indicators, we would tend not to say that hairdressers have good jobs. And that's why job quality's multidimensionality is, is somewhat tricky, both to measure and to intervene to support. There are a number of different um, indices, which are composites of job quality measures. And I've put one on the screen just as a way of showing you the kind of things that they contain. So the one by Munoz de, de Bustillo and colleagues is the one used by the EU. Um, and you see from that that pay is a part of job quality, but it's not a predominant part. It's 20% on their measure. That's the weighting that it's given. Um, but other features such as the intrinsic nature of your work, the characteristics of your work, 
and your um, broader health and safety and work-life balance are also included. So there is some consensus of the kind of areas that constitute good job quality. I tend to focus and my team tend to focus on three important areas. We, we focus on the, import, the quality of your employment. Do you have a stable contract? Is your income stable? Are your hours predictable? Is your income sufficient? Measures like that. We also focus on the quality of your task and your work. So is your job fulfilling? Does it challenge you? Does it use your skills? Is it stretching? Is it something that you can develop meaning and purpose from? Do you feel dedicated and absorbed in your work? And our third element is what we refer to as workplace quality. And that's really looking at the governance context of your context of work. Who makes decisions? Do you have a voice in those decisions? Do you have any influence when you exercise your voice? What are workplace relationships like? And are they something that increase your perceptions of how good or poor work is? So that's the focus that we use. Um, the top line finding of all of the measures of job quality would suggest that the UK is in the top quartile of, of job quality in the world. And that's interesting, but there's, that, doesn't, that hides, I suppose, as a composite measure, some of the things that are going on underneath that overarching measure, because researchers have become increasingly concerned about rising numbers of what we might call bad jobs, deterioration in what we might call good jobs, and the implication that that has for the stock of jobs, because of course, bad jobs and, and good jobs change in terms of their proportions within the economy, and that, that's a concern. There are some real challenges around data. So there are some things that we have very good data on. We've got very good data on employment quality indicators, reasonably okay data on task or work quality indicators. Although one important source of that, the European Working Conditions Survey will now disappear because we won't be part of that in the UK as a consequence of leaving the European Union. We have much poorer data when it comes to workplace quality and that's an, an issue that I'll pick up later on. Here in Scotland, of course, for the last seven or eight years, we've had a very strong policy interest in, a, in job quality, or the term of preference in Scotland is fair work. And Scotland has had a fair work convention established in 2015, established by the Scottish government, but independent of Scottish government. It has a membership of employers and trade unions and, and some um, academic advice reflecting a broadly social partnership approach to what job quality or fair work looks like in Scotland. It has two roles, to advise the Scottish Government in relation to fair work and to advocate more widely in Scottish society and beyond to, for fair, fair work and for the promotion of fair work. The Convention launched its framework in uh, 2016, and that's available online if anybody wants to have a look over, at it. And that outlines why we think it's important and what we, what we think job quality is, and I'll look at that in a second. But it's really worth stressing that all of what the Convention does and all of what the Fair Work Framework aims at is to improve the well-being of our citizens in work, and therefore has a very strong overlap with wider um, agendas of well-being. So I won't spend much time in this because the framework has been out there for rather a long time, but we, we define fair work as being something that offers um, opportunity, fulfillment, respect, security and voice that is a balance between the rights and responsibilities of employers and employees. And we argue very strongly can generate mutual benefits across all of those groups. We have an aspirational visit vision, which is that Scotland should be a world leader in fair work. And one single recommendation, the organisations with um, a locus in the area of work should strive to deliver it. The change levers at the heart of the convention are workplace cooperation and dialogue, so problem solving, problem identification and problem uh, and, and, and evaluation within workplaces but also the establishment of um, industry level or sector level structures where appropriate. And we saw, saw the growth of some of those during the pandemic and um, a commitment to broader partnership arrangements, collaboration and to mutual gains from the process of the delivery of fair work. Before I, before I move on, you'll notice that the term we use is fair work in Scotland. The term of preference in England is good work. In the EU, it's better work. At the ILO, it's decent work. Does the terminology matter? Well, for the most part, no. 
um, we're all talking about similar things, but I think there's something very important about the emphasis on fair work in Scotland, because fair work draws attention to two or three really quite significant things. The first is it draws attention to the notion of, of what we might call the distributive problem. What is it just for people to have in work? Who gets what? And why do some people get more access to aspects of fair work than others? I think the second important element of um, fairness in the context of fair work is the idea that um, we draw attention not just to the distributive issue, but also to the procedural issue, how our decisions arrived at. So we don't just look at who gets a part of the cake, we look at how the cake is divided. And implicit within that, and implicit within the fair work framework, is an interest by everyone to have a bigger cake. The way in which fair work can drive a larger amount of resource to be distributed. So in that sense, I think the term fair is a useful one. I've put on the slide, the very colourful slide, which is on the screen at the moment, I've put on the slide the fair work dimensions. And what I've indicated on that is the way in which those benefit individuals. And I won't go through those because it's, because it's very clear that the benefits of fair work accrue to individuals. It makes their working life better. It makes them more prosperous. It gives them greater confidence in work. It allows them to enhance their own self-respect and self-esteem self during work. And I'll come back to, to talk about what are the benefits for fair work for other parties, for employers and for the state. But for the moment, let's, let's stick with individuals. And I'm going to very quickly, because I'm conscious that we have got 45 minutes and not as I had understood an hour, I'm going to very quickly scan through some of the data on whether or not people in Scotland and the UK do have fair work. The reason why I'm specifying Scotland and the UK is there are quite a lot of areas where we don't have good data for Scotland and we can't disaggregate it. So therefore we use UK data because we have no really good reason to believe that the profile of good work in the UK is, in the rest of the UK is, is really any different from what it is in Scotland. So let's run through some of those, some of these challenges and gaps in the area of fair work. So if we look at security, we know that in surveys throughout the world, people value job security incredibly highly it is the most valued aspect of job quality. And we can understand why that's the case, because of the benefits that security bring. But we've seen quite a significant rise in non-standard working in the UK and indeed across other economies. So at the moment, about 20% of people in the UK labour force are on non-standard contracts. Some of those will be on those contracts by choice. We can't assume that all of that 20% all of are in somehow a precarious position. But what we do know from studying the evidence is that those non-standard working arrangements tend to bring with them poor job quality. They tend to bring lower pay, fewer access to benefits, fewer access to sick pay and maternity leave, um, and, and, and so forth. So we know that non-standard working is fundamentally associated with poorer job quality. Of course, that means 80% of people are in open-ended, relatively secure employment. Um, but actually in the UK, we're at the, the, the bottom end, really, of the OECD advanced nations when it comes to, to employment tenure. So people have employment tenures on average of about seven years, and that's relatively short compared to other countries. We know there's a concern about underemployment. Underemployment means that you don't have enough hours of work to make a sufficient income or not as many hours as you want to have. And there is a massive occupational class gradient in underemployment. And when, I'm, when I use the term occupational class, I'm really referring to the hierarchy of the standard occupational classifications which has managers and professionals at the top, and it has routine workers at the bottom. And if you look at underemployment, it's very rare to have underemployment as a manager or a professional. It's very common to have it as a routine worker, much more common than it is at the other end. We've heard a lot of discussion about zero hours contracts and the concerns that zero hours contracts are a poor form of job quality and are exploitative. Um, there's probably about 700,000 people in the UK on a zero hours contract. There's a much bigger proportion of people who have anxiety about working hours instability. Around 1.7 million employees in the UK report that they are anxious about the unpredictability of their hours, despite having, um, having open-ended contracts. And we know that that insecurity feeds through to insecurity in pay. It feeds through to poorer working conditions, and it feeds through to... Um, in, in some senses to performance intensification. 
There's also insecurity across significant parts, about 29% of the UK labour force, about job status. So valued aspects of their job are they have concerns over whether or not those valued aspects will continue. So a deterioration in their own job. And interestingly, job insecurity is quite common across the occupational hierarchy. It doesn't have a gradient. So managers and professionals are also very um, concerned. Since the 1990s, we've seen a bit of a convergence around job insecurity. So that's a whole series of challenges. Low pay is a big challenge. Um, on 2019 data, about 19% of people in the UK are on low pay who are in work at 25% if we talk about hourly data because that takes into account insufficient hours. Low pay is highly gendered so um, one in five women are low paid compared to one in seven men and low pay drives the UK's significant income inequality and indeed in work poverty and we know now that around 59% of people who are in in work poverty are in working households so it's not the case that, that being in work necessarily protects you from poverty. Non-pay benefits track pay. So if you're highly paid, you get, high, you get higher levels of benefits. If you're poorly paid, you get low levels of benefits. And that gap is widening over recent years. And in, in an overarching sense, what we've seen is the wage share. So the proportion of national income or national income that goes to labor has deteriorated quite significantly while the proportion that goes to profits has increased. So we've got real, some real security challenges in, in sections of the labour market. I don't think it'll be a particular surprise to anybody when we start to talk about opportunity uh, that fair work conditions are differentially distributed across people in different categories. So across pretty much all of the protected characteristics, women, young people and old people in, different, in, in relation to different dimensions, um, race, disability, job quality is much lower for those people in those with protected characteristics than it is for other people. And that's systematically embedded and well entrenched in the UK economy. So that's one problem with opportunity. Another problem is the emergence, even in good jobs, of a very clear class ceiling. So we, we heard from the, the Social Mobility Commission a few years ago, that even if you look at professional work, graduate based work, what we find is that people of low socioeconomic origins tend to have more difficulties in achieving professional work. And even when they get there, they face a, 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 a significant social origins pay gap. So there are real challenges of opportunity. And remember, class is not a, a protected characteristic in the UK, um, although some people argue very strongly that it should be. And the most systematic variation we see in UK job quality is by occupational class. So on almost every index, whether it's pay and benefits, whether it's contracts, uh, whether it's um, in job design or intrinsic work characteristics, and almost all of those indicators, the higher you are up the occupational hierarchy, the more likely you are to experience better job quality. There is one exception, and that's work-life balance. Senior level occupations tend to report more challenges with work-life balance, work balance, but even then that's a bit tricky because on the one hand, they work longer hours. Many of those hours are unpaid, but on the other hand, they have access to much better flexible working arrangements. So somewhat, somewhat curious. And there's no occupational gradient when it comes to health in the most recent data. Moving on to talk about fulfillment, there are some key job fulfillment challenges from UK data. So we've noticed over recent years a real concern with what we call skills underutilization. And that simply means that you go to work and you do not use the skills that you have because your job is insufficiently challenging. We see quite significant proportions of the UK labour force and UK managers reporting that people's skills are not well used in, in workplaces. So some CIPD, the Chartered Institute of Personal Development work from 2018, suggested that more than one third of workers in the UK don't have effective skills utilization. And at the other end, one tenth don't have enough training to give them the skills to carry out their jobs effectively. We've seen a decline in recent years in task discretion. And you remember I said that for sociological research, that control that you have over work is quite important. We know that task discretion is incredibly closely associated with individual well-being. 
So being able to have some control over what we do improves our own well-being. But we've seen a decline really since about 2012 in levels of task disc discretion in Britain, alongside increasingly demanding work. So the statistics on people who report high stress jobs, highly demanding work in Francis Green's terms, suggest that about 35% of people in the UK report high stress jobs, which is significantly higher than other advanced economies. And lastly, in fulfilment, it's very clear that there's differential access to training and development in the UK. The biggest, the, the biggest correlation with access to training and development in the UK labour force is whether or not you have high education. If you're highly educated, you get more training and development. We might have thought that it would be important to invest in the training and development of people who were less well educated, who had fewer qualifications. But at the bottom end of the labour market, some people, a significant minority, receive no training and work at all, other than to meet statutory or regulatory requirements. When it comes to respect, and I'm going to speed up on some of these because we'll run out of time. When it comes to respect, we know that health and well-being is affected by poor quality jobs. The people in poor quality jobs have the lowest amount of health and well-being. We know that people's physical and mental health are impacted by, um, by having poor work. About 23% of people say work is bad for their physical health, and 25% say it's bad for their mental health. There are real health concerns around the demanding work that I just referred to and, and the way in which that um, is, is, is growing in Britain. And a significant minority are concerned about the way in which their work impacts on their wider, um, wider work and family activity. A fifth of respondents for the CIPD says their job strongly affects their personal life. And 24% find it hard to relax in normal, uh, normal home life because of the demands of their jobs. We don't have very good data around bullying at work, but we know that about 15% from CIPD data suggests, 15% of people suggest that they are bullied at work. And quite a proportion of that, around 40%, is not interpersonal bullying, not get, you know, bullying by individuals. It's bully, bullying related to performance. And lastly, there are huge gaps when it comes to effective voice in the UK. Part of that reflects the, design, the institutional uh, deterioration of trade unions in the UK. So the fact that we have lower trade union density and collective bargaining coverage since the late 70s. And the corresponding rise in what we might call management sponsored voice practices has not compensated for that, um, for that deterioration in, in collective voice. There are, there are the, the most recent systematic data we have is collected in 2011 from the Workplace Employment Relations Survey, which is unfortunately now discontinued. But that suggests that about 48% of people in UK workplaces um, sorry, 48% of UK workplaces and about 28% of employees have access to systematic voice channels at an individual level within their workplaces. Those channels, however, show some evidence of hollowing out. So what management consult on has become further away from real decision-making and influence. So we've seen a decrease in managers consulting on early stage plans, and an increase in managers consulting on management preferred options. So the role of consultation has changed and higher level consultation on strategic issues has also, um, has also deteriorated over the, in the UK. Interestingly enough, there is a gold standard for voice, which we find from the workplace employment relations data, which suggests that voice produces better outcomes where you have individual live channels and you have some collective channels. And that's the gold standard because it improves firm performance as well as improving individual well-being. But that exists in the UK on the most recent data in 10% of workplaces and for 30% of employees. Why does it matter? Why does any of it matter? Well, we clearly know that it matters to the individuals who experience poor job quality. But why does it matter to anybody else? Well, let's start with employers. I would argue very strongly that it matters to employers because they miss out on all of the benefits that arrive, arise from the provision of good and fair work. We know that secure employment um, can enhance employee commitment, increase their trust, support their learning and their skills development, and reduce turnover, which is often very important. 
We know that opportunity leads to more diverse organizations where you access new talent and new ideas. We know that fulfillment makes people more likely to be engaged in their work and unleashes creativity and innovation. We know that respect protects employers from legal liability and improves communications and social exchange and enhances worker involvement. And we know that effective voice allows constructive engagement and participation in the workplace. So all of those things are not just good for individuals, they are good for employees, for employers as well. And aside from the separate dimensions of fair work, the combined impact of fair work practices is very positive for what we call discretionary behaviours. So we use a framework called the AMO framework, which is a theory of employee performance, which suggests that if you have the right ability, if you have the right skills, if your skills are invested in and kept up to date, if you have the right motivation, which might be both extrinsic, you feel well rewarded, or intrinsic, you feel well engaged in your work. And if you have jobs that give you scope to make a difference, then you are likely as an employee to engage in discretionary behaviours that benefit your employer, either discretionary performance behaviours or discretionary innovation behaviours. And therefore, that configuration of practices that Fair Work delivers produces positive outcomes for employers. This is a very busy slide, so I don't really expect you to, to make anything of it. I just wanted to put it up there to make one point. What this slide is, is a set of practices which my team have worked on over a, a, a period of years in a project called Fair Innovative and Transformative Work. And what it does is to say, can we identify a relationship between the operation of certain types of fair work practices and outcomes that are valued by employers? And we've mapped all of these relationships in, in, a, in a variety of different ways. And what those columns tell you are the kinds of practices that will support discretionary performance, innovation behaviours, and that will enhance trust. And we know that trust also supports discretionary performance and innovation behaviours. And the reason why I wanted to put the slide up is really not so that you can read any of it, but it was to, to draw attention to the numbers in the brackets, because what the numbers in the brackets tell us is how frequently those practices are adopted. So one of the challenges for fair work in, in the UK and in Scotland is not that we don't know what practices work, it's that employers don't adopt them. Okay, so we see low levels of, of for example, access to flexible working or giving people time to reflect and problem solve, low levels of collective voice. And we need to ask the question then, why are those practices adopted? If good work benefits us all, why isn't common sense common practice? And that's a question that we really need to ask of, of employers. Part of the answer to that is that for some employers, low quality work is highly profitable. The nature of their product market, the nature of their business model is built specifically around low quality work and it can be highly profitable in the short and in the longer term. Part of the problem is that while poor work practices might cause difficulties for employers collectively, for example, in terms of recruitment, recruiting people with the right sets of skills, for example, but it might not cause a problem for individual employers. So that unit of analysis problem, who are we talking about when we try to understand where, where the, the drivers for, for poorer work come from? Employers clearly face different pressures when it comes to um, labor market and product market characteristics. So some employers are in a product market where you cannot, you cannot be a successful business unless you engage in, you deliver high quality work. Your customers expect it. If you have a high value added product or a high value added service, your customers expect that to be delivered by people in whom you've invested. Similarly, for some employers, labor market pressures require that you have high quality working practices because otherwise you simply won't have any staff or staff of the right quality. But the real challenge exists in circumstances where labor market pressures or product market pressures don't produce good quality work. So where you've got low level personalized services, for example, that people don't, are not willing to pay a lot of money for, then how do you ensure that work is maintained at a high quality? Sometimes, it, it, 
an investment in high quality work arises because of an employer's values. So an employer may decide that fundamentally their moral or, or philosophical position is one where they invest in good quality work. And we see great examples of that in Scotland and, and elsewhere in the UK. Scotland currently has a, a business purpose commission, which is looking precisely at that. What's the role of business values and business purpose in the kinds of outcomes that businesses produce? But that's not always the case. And often what we see is um, something which academics call unhelpfully mimetic isomorphism. Often what we see is that businesses copy other businesses. Fancy term, very easy explanation. Businesses copy what they see. So if you set up a business, you set up a business in the same way as other businesses that you have, you have identified. And therefore your business takes the same form. And we see an awful lot then of similarities in the way in which certain kinds of businesses operate. And that's not always to the benefit of, of high quality work. The other challenge, of course, is structural. Fair work is nested in a whole series of different kinds of systems that can constrain its delivery. In most businesses, fair work is not a first order strategy. It can be. You may, as an employer, decide that you, your primary purpose as an employer is to run a high quality uh, business for your own employees, but that's not often the case. More often than that, work is an outcome of, it's a second order or a third order outcome of other business decisions. So decisions about what your value proposition is or what your business model might be. Decisions about what your broader organizational strategy is. And those decisions are both constrained and facilitated by the operation of, of wider markets, including global markets and institutional arrangements uh, that either constrain or facilitate how employers behave. If we were to do a quick aside and look at P&O, we would argue that that is a business model. Um, the recent redundancies of P&O are a business model which reflect an organisational strategy for which the outcome is the redundancies of, of the workers um, who were previously employed and for which institutions, government legislation and regulation, doesn't seem to have much of an answer. It's not, we've got soft institutions that are not making much of a difference. And sometimes that takes us to a place where we need to think about why society should intervene, where employers don't, where markets don't to deliver fair work. So we've talked about the benefits to individuals of, of good quality and fair work. We've now talked about the benefits to employers. What's the benefit to society as a whole? Well, fundamentally, good work produces better citizen well-being. Uh, we are better off for having good work. But there are huge externalities of poor work that fall on the wider society. So when people are in poor work, certainly poorly paid work, what happens is that has an implication for government spending on welfare, on welfare benefits. It reduces tax revenues. It requires, it has an impact on, on health. So it requires that, that there is an additional spend excuse me, in, terms of, in terms of the NHS. So there are externalities of poor work, which the state tends to pick up. And for that reason, the state might have an interest in reducing, uh, in reducing uh, poor quality work. Poor quality, improving the quality of work also helps with efficient resource allocation, it allows us to draw more people from different protected characteristics into employment and into good employment. And that's very, very good for social cohesion, which is part of the priority for the Scottish government. If we don't have good work, quite a lot of the money that we spend on education, and we spend a lot of money on education in Scotland, quite a lot of that, that spend is, um, is not well realised. So if people have higher level skills and qualifications than the jobs they do, then the returns to that skill and skill investment and education investment is, is minimal. What happens within workplaces in terms of um, conflict resolution, in terms of solving problems can actually be really important from a societal point of view. So if workplaces do better in terms of the processes of fair work, we're less likely to see people take legal action. We're less likely to pay money for employment tribunals. We're more likely to encourage the development of skills of good conflict handling, which can apply to other domains of, of, of public and private life. And I suppose fundamentally what I'm saying is society should pursue fair work and the state should pursue fair work because markets won't 
or markets won't always. For the state, the pursuit of fair work allows them to um, focus on where value is created in the economy and how that value is shared and distributed. So it takes us very closely to where value, value creation takes place and to the kinds of business models which impact um, on broader uh, inequality and in our society. But the other point I want to make this evening is one of the reasons why society should address fair work is to, is to should pursue fair work is to address what we might call wicked problems. So wicked problems are complex, unruly things with um, which can't be solved with current, current resources, which require stakeholder collaboration, in which stakeholders have different interests. And wicked problems are amenable to more complex and sophisticated collaboration of the kind that fair work helps to deliver. What might those be? Well, I think we've done quite an interesting experiment in the last few years of managing people in a pandemic. I think that was a very challenging problem, which transformed how we managed people in organisations overnight. All of a sudden, what happened in work became incredibly important. Whether you could go to work, whether your work was safe, whether your economic activity could be continued. We saw a massive expansion in working from home. It didn't appear to have much of an effect on efficiency and productivity, either as reported by employees themselves or indeed as reported by managers. So, so about 40 or 50% of people reported that, that productivity was the same and about 30% said it was increased. Very few people said that productivity decreased when they worked from home. It's clearly the case, and there's a missing word on the slide, that the pandemic exacerbated some pre-existing inequalities. So women's experience of low pay became worse during the pandemic. Some voice channels increased, and we would have expected them to in order to implement public health restrictions within workplaces, but we also saw a rise in workplaces that had no voice channels at all, um, which is a curious thing, it might be interesting to work out how public health restrictions were managed in those contexts. But we actually saw a much greater appreciation amongst survey respondents to the CIPD about how voice, work, voice worked within their own workplaces. The, the quality of voice and dialogue and representation improved. What became really clear in research over the last few years is that where businesses had invested in fair work in the past, it stood them in very good stead to manage the challenges of the pandemic. Where you had high quality jobs, where people could take autonomous decisions, where they could work flexibly, where they were secure in the work that they did, they were much more able to be able to respond and adapt. We also saw some other interesting benefits. Um, my own team analysed the CIPD Quality of Working Life Survey, which took place just, one took place in January 2020, so just before the pandemic, and the next one in January 2021. So it gave us the first snapshot of what, how job quality had changed over that course of, over that incredibly disruptive period. And interestingly, um, very little had changed, to be perfectly honest. Um, Work-life balance had improved, unsurprisingly, and, and it improved even more the number of hours that people worked from home. People's health and well-being improved. Um, there are some concerns over aspects of job, job quality, such as isolation and burnout. But it's very clear that response to the pandemic showed, illustrated the stickiness of good job quality and the way in which it became an asset for employers in being able to deal with a period of massively disruptive change. But it also illustrated clearly the embeddedness of poor job quality. So the pre-existing inequalities um, stayed the same or, or got worse. Just very quickly, we had some new categories of workers. We'd furloughed workers for the first, first time ever. Um, they, their job quality was, was, couldn't be compared with previously. They didn't exist before, but they, were, they reported the highest levels of job insecurity. So being furloughed, although it protected your income, didn't make people feel less anxious about the work that they did. Perhaps even more interestingly, we now have a category of critical workers who the government defined as being essential to the ongoing um, conduct of economic and other activities over the pandemic. And the critical workers stem from high level occupations to low level occupations. Critical workers on every, almost every job quality indicator were worse than other workers. They reported much more negatively. Work-life balance, health and well-being, access to resources to do their job, 
and so forth. So critical workers came out of that um, really poorly on, on anything and everything other than meaning and purpose in work. So the pandemic showed us that we could have high quality jobs that would assist employers and society in the responsiveness that was required to be able to cope with the challenges of the pandemic. So where else could we apply um, the benefits of fair work to wicked problems? Well, one, one area might be in terms of the, the UK productivity puzzle. And the productivity puzzle in the UK is A, that we have had a lag in a slow growing productivity since the global financial crisis, and B, that we lag um, average G7 productivity by about 16%. And that, that's an important lag. Andy Haldane, formerly of the Bank of England, now for, of the, Royal, uh, the RSA, used to talk about leaders and laggards, that we had businesses that were doing really well in terms of productivity and businesses that were doing very poorly. And there has been an emergence of a debate which suggests that part of why some businesses do really poorly is to do with the kinds of management and work practices that those businesses adopt. The work of Bloom and Van Rienen draws our attention to the way in which the use of targets, monitoring and incentive can massively increase productivity, but aren't widely used within the UK economy. And, that, and that's one of the possible explanations given as to why productivity lags in those laggard companies that, had, that has Haldane referred to. There are other explanations of productivity, productivity challenges in the UK, such as um, corporate governance practices that don't that deter and inhibit innovation because of short term um, return, fixation on short term returns. But we're particularly interested in what's the role of fair work in enhancing productivity? How does that improve productivity of, of lagging businesses? Our current research focuses really on that the relationship between fair work and performance enhancements that drive productivity, such as innovation. And it's very clear from that research that intrinsic work factors, the type of work you do, how engaging it is, is an important driver of performance, innovation, and well-being. But crucially, and equally strong, is the role of investments in job quality, where people feel fairly treated where they feel that their, uh, their experience is, where they feel secure in their experience of work, that that drives ve uh, very strongly a commitment to performance and to innovation. And innovation is an important driver of productivity. And that's similar to the findings of the UK Working Life Survey, which also focuses on the relationship between good work and task and context performance. So task performance, the job you do, context performance, the other things that you do that improve your own organisation. I'm going to quickly move on because I think we might be about to run out of time. I'm hoping somebody will tell me. Um, we can apply a very similar argument to, to automation. So we, we know that prior to the pandemic, there were big challenges around the adoption of automation and the implications that it might have. Some really scary stories about the job destruction that automation would bring. Um, very polarised accounts of what automation would bring to the UK economy, giving us a very bright or a very brutal future. Real concerns that because of the adherence or the, the, the attachment of some UK employers to low cost business models and low cost labour, that what we would see is automation being delivered in, or automation either not being delivered or being delivered to reduce job quality rather than to enhance it. But all of that is a choice. The choice of how technology can be used and its impact on job quality and, 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 and fair work is a choice that businesses make. Not a choice without constraints, but a choice that's, that is open and available to them. And there are some very good examples of the way in which businesses have decided to use automation to raise people's skills, to improve the quality of their own work. So clearly, uh, businesses are constrained in their response to automation, but they still have scope for particular choices. And those choices, when they are made in the direction of good and fair work, actually act as a driver to innovation. So there's very good longitudinal data from the EU suggesting that an investment in good quality work pays off in terms of long-term innovation performance. Again, we can make the same argument when it comes to climate sustainability. 
So we know that workplaces have an important role in carbon production. We know that labour movements across the world have been active in trying to uh, around climate issues. But we know there are tensions there between the potential for job destruction and the, the scarring effect of industrial transition and an interest in uh, clean green jobs. We know that employees have a role as a potentially important change agent when it comes to how businesses address green agendas. They can identify areas where green improvements can be made. And all of that draws on the very characteristics of fair work that, we outlined, that I outlined earlier. So the ability to engage in dialogue, the ability to feel secure, the alignment of green agendas with health and safety and wellbeing agendas, the opportunity to be creative around um, deploying skills and talents to, to improve firms' environmental performance, the very process of discussing environmental issues within businesses, having a dialogue which allows uh, environmental improvement to be made. All of that um, is picked up in research which focuses on how on the ground people can deliver change that makes a real difference in terms of climate change. So my, one of my own PhD students, Andrew Bratton, a few years ago did quite a lot of case study work around how businesses in Scotland used their relationships with their own employees and their own trade unions to drive a strong environmental agenda in which everybody had a clear interest. And that process of addressing climate change and job quality simultaneously has been endorsed both by the Fair Work Convention, but endorsed also by Scotland's Just Transition Commission, who've argued very strongly that workforces need to be an essential partner when it comes to environmental progress. There are concerns, however, that businesses are not doing enough or that people don't trust businesses to do enough. So some recent research um, in 2022 by Business in the Community in Scotland suggested that in fact, uh, while people were supportive in the public, well, people in the public were supportive of an, a broad environmental agenda, they didn't think that they would share in it. And they didn't think that businesses would share the gains from it. And so a fair work perspective on that might take us into a place where the possibility of mutual gains is made much more clear. So how do we change it all? I'll finish off very quickly on how do we embed fair work within our economy? Lots of people have a role here. We have multiple actors, employers, government, trade unions, civil society, campaigning organisations, and consumers, importantly. All of those have a role to play in the, the embedding of fair work within Scotland. Employers are fundamentally the key decision maker. Employers make the decisions about job quality. So that might work due to labour supply pressures. It might work because their values are consistent with fair work. It might work because we see much more shareholder activism and investment, investor influence around some of these areas, although that's not been such a feature that we've seen much of. It might work because consumers choose to use good employers before they use poorer employers. And actually, at, at, at this point, we should ask ourselves questions about what we do with our own purchasing decisions. Do our purchasing decisions uphold fair work or do they defeat the purpose of fair work in how we choose to spend our resources? What can government do? Well, rather a lot in my view and governments at different levels. I think we need to challenge, we need to have a very consistent and um, coherent narrative around fair work being good for everybody. And fair work is something that drives growth and inclusive growth. We need to challenge the argument that say, employment protection um, will cost us jobs. All of the evidence suggests that that's not the case. We need to challenge the argument that says, well, bad jobs are just a stepping stone for people who access the labor market at one level, but move on because we know that too many people stay in a bad jobs trap. We need to challenge the notion that somehow if we embed fair work in our economy, that businesses will go somewhere else because that, that's unlikely to be the case. We need to address some really key issues that we talked about earlier. We need to address chronically insecure work either by having better minimum standards or at the very least enforcing the standards that we have. We need to review what happens in terms of work family policy and address some of the issues that have come up during the pandemic. We need crucially to try and find ways of embedding competing voices 
as an asset to business decision making. So we need to find ways in which voices that are underrepresented are heard within business decision making. There is an important role for government to disincentivize business models that are built on poor quality work. They can do that in their relations with business. They can do it using conditionality and public funding and public procurement. They can do that in some, not the, UK, not the Scottish government, but the UK government could do that by forms of regulation. And that incentivization, disincentivization of poor business models and incentivization of better stakeholder orientation is part of the route to improving job quality. How do they do it? In a variety of ways that are available to government. They're not straightforward, but they're available. So reform of corporate governance to encourage a far closer stakeholder orientation, consistent with lots of European economies, would be one step forward for the UK government. If we look at areas for which the Scottish government has, has responsibilities, the provision of business support through enterprise agencies and economic development funds can be a way in which uh, fair work is embedded. And we've seen really good examples of that across the Scottish economy in recent years. Employment protections need to, are something that the UK government is responsible for, but there is a very strong argument now that employment protections are not in the light of the p and um, debacle really fit for purpose. And government relations, how government engage with business, how government talk to business, what government, how gov government support business to develop their own capacities is an important lever. Crucially for governments, we need some joined up policy. We need to be able to see fair work, not as a nice to have, not as something that's just about being good to employees, but is something which is well aligned to how we invest in skills, how we innovate, how we spend money supporting businesses, how we solve some of those rather large um, challenges in the economy around policy redu poverty reduction or inequality or inclusivity. What does that all add up to? Well, I think we will see some challenges in sustaining a commitment to fair work through tough times. Um, we know that there will be some economic difficulties ahead and that, that fair work is often something that's thought to be a luxury of good times and not a driver um, in, in bad times. We have some real challenges around multi-level governance. So some of the areas for which there are responsibilities for fair work are held at Westminster and others are held within the Scottish government. And we will, we'll, I think we have already seen the emergence of some policy disalignment there. What I would say is that there's no short term fix. There's a reason why the Fair Work Convention had an aspiration to be a leading fair work employer in, te in sorry, society in 10 years. It's because we knew that it was a rather big job, that what we were talking about was not tinkering with the edges of, of, of the economic model, but it was engaging in some quite fundamental changes in how the economy and businesses operate. In all of that, it won't be government that drive um, on their own the, the embedding of fair work in Scotland, and it certainly won't be the Fair Work Convention. There is a, a requirement for a social movement in which consumers, campaigners, trade unions, government, businesses, all professional organisations, regulatory bodies come together to embed what we know would be very good for our economy. But the prize that we seek with fair work is enormous. The prize of having a dynamic, well-functioning, responsive economy, an economy in which people, no matter where their life begins, can find meaning and fulfillment and prosperity through work. That prize is enormous. That prize is worth striving for. That prize is why a lot of the eight hours that I will spend every day between now and retirement will be focused on how we best deliver fair work. Thank you. Be it, there'll be a five minute break now uh, and then we'll have the question and answer session. I, th I think we'll we'll just start the, the question and answer session now. So um, other Trish is going to be the, the runner for that. So. 
questions from the, the floor? Thank you very much for an interesting discussion <coughs> and having worked for nearly 60 years of my life, I quite agree that fair work would be nice. However, you missed, in my opinion, the key point. The key point is that if we want to have a larger cake to slice up, we need to generate more jobs. And our current government have an anti-capitalist, non-job generation. In fact, Scotland have had it for years. We had the roots plant came up and we ruined that by trade unionism. British Leyland came up to build trucks, we ruined that. Nissan went to the Northeast and made a success of it. How do we in Scotland generate jobs, not just good jobs? Good jobs will come. I think the evidence is that good jobs don't necessarily arise out of a proliferation of employment. And what we've actually seen over the last few years is a rise in the number of, of pretty poor jobs. There's quite a number of different things in your question. I'll try and take them separately. So the creation, I, I think there's, an in, there's been an interesting policy influence on employers where employers have been encouraged. And remember, we want to have employers, we want to have good employers, where employers have been encouraged to deliver jobs without thinking too much about their quality. And that has created forms of businesses and business models which have within them their own tensions that deliver, that, that, that impose externalities on the rest of society and the rest of the economy. I don't think I would accept your premise around trade unionism. So I would argue that, and, and of course, trade unionism takes a variety of different um, forms. There is, there's a very clear association of good job quality in countries where there is a presence of trade unionism and poorer job quality in countries where there is an absence of them. Now, that doesn't suggest that in all circumstances, all trade unions or all employers do the right or the wrong thing. But we do know that highly productive, highly innovative economies have institutionally embedded voice for workers and that that works well. It works well, not just in terms of the quality of their jobs, it works well in terms of skills policy. It works well in terms of responses to automation. So the relationships which unions and employers have and have had in Scotland and in the UK aren't simply coloured by the activities of trade unions, they're coloured by the stance which employers take. I was in Sweden a few years ago and there was an interesting discussion about unproductive plants. And the, the argument that was made by trade unions and employers was you would not fight to maintain an unproductive plant in operation you would come up with something else. Part of the challenge in the UK is that losing your job is a cliff edge. If you lose your job, the opportunity of getting another one at the same level, at the same quality is really quite restricted. And therefore that change of economic activity and the disruption that it causes is much more costly because of the interaction between the labor market and the welfare system in the UK. So, so I'm not sure I accept your initial premise that, that either the current government, and I don't have a position on the current government in Scotland, I, I don't think I accept the position that they are job destroying, or indeed that trade unions by their nature are job destroying. Can I follow up on that? Because I find that a very interesting point. <clears throat> I wondered if you could comment on the fact that um, the um, economy in Scotland um, is generally lagging behind the economy in the other three nations. And if it's not due to employment, then I wonder what it is due to. Lagging behind in what regard? In well, the economy generally. In all regards. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure I accept that premise that the economy lags in all regards. I mean, in fact, the productivity gap between pro Scotland and the rest of the UK has been closing for a number of years. Employment rates are not dissimilar. Um, productivity levels within sectors are not dissimilar. Some of the issues about differences between Scotland and the rest of the UK are compositional. 
So they are, um, and I'm not an economist, but they are compositional in the sense that the composition of different economies, if you look at, for example, the composition of the, the southeast of England, and including London, what you find is that that drives some of the numbers in the rest for, for, for England in a way that if you were to take those economies out and look at it regionally, you don't get those big differences. So I, I'm not sure you're specifying to me where, where the economy is doing so badly in Scotland relative to the UK for me to explain why I think that might be the case. I'm not sure that... I, I, I don't know enough about ferry building to answer that question. question up at the top here. Uh, good evening. Uh, can you hear me? Good evening. Um, have the owners of p and done anything... Have the owners of p and done anything illegal? And if they have, should they face criminal charges? Well, they have done something illegal because they didn't, they, under the, the requirement to consult on collective redundancies of redundancies of above 30 people, they didn't do that. And they've been very clear that they didn't do that. So yes, they have, they have done something illegal. That's something which has a civil, not a criminal penalty. It, it would require, however, those employees to raise that through uh, an employment tribunal action in order to achieve some remedy. And the extent of the remedy which they might achieve may be less than what p and is offering to pay them. Could I just ask you uh, about employee share schemes in the context of providing fair work and employees' attitude changing towards employers under that kind of company? So you're talking about employing employee-owned enterprises or share schemes? Okay. Um, share, employee share schemes have sort of fallen as an area of interest over the last few years. They were, they were a particular feature in the 80s and 90s that share ownership would um, affect, would, would be something that employees would do and the share distributions took place profit sharing arrangements took place and that, that that would change the character of employment relations. I think we should maybe not fall into the trap of thinking that employment relations are terrible in the UK or indeed in Scotland. In actual fact, all of the indicators of poor employment relations have, have gone down in recent years, although they may be about to move back up again, um, given the cost of living crisis. But yeah, there's more information on the impact of, of employee-owned businesses on things like performance and innovation and commitment than there is on the impact of share ownership. The, the, the literature's quite old, but my memory of it is that it didn't seem to make a huge difference because the number of shares owned were small. They, tend to be, they tended to be small both in relation to um, the share distribution, but also in relation to the income and wealth of the people who held them, except when it comes to senior managers. So senior managers often, uh, the, the impact of share ownership by senior managers is often quite significant in terms of how they view their own share ownership, because it can be a much more significant source of wealth. But it's, a very, it's quite an old literature. It's not something that really features in much of the contemporary discussion about, share, about um, fair work. It's not something that we think is a necessary part of fair work. Hi. Um, I've worked in the software industry in, in uh, Scotland for 30 years. And one thing you, you, you talked about what to do about this. Um, it, it very much comes down to two or three people in organizations, the culture, the chief executive, and maybe one or two senior managers. And you talked about what to do about this. They all know that empowered employees are more productive. We've been told for years and years and years. However, your solutions to the problem entirely focused on central government. And to me, that's, that's not gonna achieve anything. In all my time, there, were no, there was nothing occurring to look, you talked about a number of good examples of good practice in Scotland, which have delivered benefits. So how are you going to persuade those senior managers who can change everything in an instant by sharing those good practices with them, get out and with them directly, rather than worrying about government? Because I think the focus has been on that for far too long. It's, it's an interesting point. So I work with businesses all the time, but our, my research team works engaging with businesses the length and breadth of Scotland all of the time. 
And we work with some tremendous businesses. We work with businesses who absolutely understand the need to empower their own employees and to do what they can to deliver that. And sometimes that's straight, more straightforward than others. So there are some spectacular examples. There are lots of good examples of businesses who are striving to do that better. So you're, you're right that sometimes that will be a catalyst within the business. So you'll have somebody potentially in a leadership position who will, will pursue that idea. Um, and there's lots of ways in which that can be supported. It can be supported through um, business support agencies. It can be supported through the private sector, through consultancy work. It can be supported through relationships with universities and academics, it, you know, so heavily engaged researchers. So I don't accept that there's a lot of businesses that, that uh, sorry, I do accept there's a lot of businesses who are doing what they can. The real challenge is the businesses who don't really engage with anybody who don't engage with employers organizations, who will similarly argue that empowerment of the employees is a good idea. Businesses that don't engage with those, who don't engage with um, economic development support or business support agencies, don't necessarily engage with the policy community or anywhere else. Part of the challenge, of course, in Scotland is that we have, as, as in the rest of the UK, we have a really high proportion of small businesses. And one of the things that takes up the time of small businesses is running the business the opportunities that they have to go and learn new things or to experiment and the risks associated with experiments can sometimes be quite high. But I think I wouldn't underestimate the fact that a lot of that is, that a lot of that is going on and works very, very well. We have some great examples in Scotland of businesses who genuinely accept that their employees are indeed their greatest asset. It's not a phrase. And they have structures and processes and practices that deliver that. We try to focus very heavily on not, we don't use the term culture a lot. Culture is a very appropriate anthropological concept. We try not to talk about culture. We talk an awful lot about practice. So sometimes what acts as a change impetus in businesses is just trying a new practice, understanding that what your practice is, is limiting people from engaging and then thinking about how you address that. So we have a really strong focus on how businesses can not necessarily transform everything they do, but take particular practices and try and try and be able to transfer, transfer those. Could we have maybe a couple of questions from the Zoom audience, please, uh, from Garant? Thanks. Certainly. Uh, many years ago, it was felt by many trade unionists that contracts compliance within the public sector could help improve the working lives of those workers contracted to or supplying public bodies. Is there still scope to achieve that? Yes, is I suppose the simple answer. Um, the public sector <coughs> has a number of different roles. Um, it has a role as potentially a model employer, but theoretically the public sector can't be too different from the private sector or otherwise it causes an imbalance in the labor market. On a whole host of indicators, job quality and fair work is higher in public sector organizations because they tend, for example, to have more systematic approaches to voice than you might find in the private sector. So you would find more union recognition agreements. They tend to have more formalized procedures around um, things like equality of opportunity or flexible working policies because it's much easier to institute those by policy direction in the public sector than it is necessarily to influence the private sector. So there are variations in job quality across the public and the private sector. I don't know if part of the question is focusing on the role of um, supply chains or the role of conditionality. Yes, I A think big it is. part of what the convention is currently interested in um, and people who are interested in changing job quality are interested in is thinking about how you can use public, pu public purchasing, whether that's through grant giving, whether it's through procurement, whether you can use that to shape the types of job quality and fair work that exist in Scotland. So for example, um, if you look at the adoption of the real living wage, the real living wage is more widely adopted in Scotland than it is anywhere else in the UK outside of London, the fastest growing area for living wage employment, partly because in the public sector more broadly, there is a policy of, of encouraging the adoption of the real living wage amongst suppliers. And so public procurement does have a form of leverage, which is important. Some of the issues around that are quite tricky 
So previously, when we were in the European Union, the issues around how much change could be done through public procurement um, aerated procurement professionals rather a lot. Um, we are still subject to World Trade Organization's rules, so there are still procurement restrictions in Scotland in terms of how you can dispense public monies, and indeed in the rest of the UK. But yes, procurement is a lever, and sometimes a very big lever. So colleagues and I, colleagues on the with colleagues on the Fair Work Convention and beyond, we've re recently been involved in um, an inquiry into the construction industry in Scotland. The construction industry is um, hugely and hugely funded by public procurement, investment in roads, hospitals, schools, and so forth. The role of procurement in improving some of the real challenges in the construction industry is one that we've spent a lot of time looking at. And there is an opportunity, I think, to think of how procurement shapes good outcomes. In principle, there's no good reason why we should spend public money to produce poor quality work that the public then has to cross subsidize and has to, has to um, improve through other, other forms. Far better that we should support good quality work in the, in the first place. Thank you. And uh, Dallas says, I heard a talk a few years ago from a trade union official. He was of the opinion that everyone should be paid the same, about 20 pounds an hour at current rates. The ones in grossier jobs would have a huge pay increase, which re would reward them and the ones in highly skilled professional or managerial jobs would have a severe pay cut, but their job satisfaction should be rewarded enough. Do you have any sympathy with this view? I'm not, I'm not sure that that would necessarily be a, a, a good approach to how we encourage the building of human capital. I think there's, uh, I take it that that was supposed to be an amusing question. Um, there, was, there was some media publicity a few years ago in the states of somebody who decided to pay all of their employees the same. I can't remember what the figure was, $70,000 or $80,000. Um, and it solved some problems and created others. The whole issue of fairness is rarely um, resolved. It comes back to the distributional, the distributive problem I talked about earlier. The whole area of fairness is rarely resolved by giving everybody equal shares because the issues around incentive and investment in human capital make that quite tricky. Where I think there is a real issue is the extent of difference between people at the bottom and tops of organisations. I think the, the High Pay Commission a few years ago suggested that chief executives in UK businesses earned 130 times more, apologies if I've got that number wrong, but it was of that, of that scale, 130 times more than the lowest paid member of their organisation. Now, there are real questions I think you might want to ask about whether or not that is an appropriate range of pay. Um, so I, I don't think I would be in favour, if, if I had any locus in this, um, of having no range in pay at all. Um, but I think that, that some of the real challenges are the, the, the difference between very low pay and very high pay. At a, at a Scottish level, I referred to you earlier to the, the, the way in which we, if we look at the, the, um, the, the picture of pay deciles in Scotland, in Scotland, we see this really sharp U-shaped graph. I would have put it on the slides, but couldn't find a recent up-to-date set of figures, but I don't think they've changed that much. So we have, if we look at pay deciles, breaking down pay into tens, we have really high numbers of highly paid jobs in Scotland. That's a good thing. But we have really equally high numbers of poorly paid jobs. And, with, and that's a problem in and of itself. But the middle is also a problem because there are insufficient spaces for people at that lowest level of income to progress into higher income. And the ability to progress in both income and career is an important incentive and something that people value highly. So that structure of pay can be quite problematic because it creates too big a gap between where people start out and where some people are. Too, too big a, a gap to be breached. There's some suggestion in the UK that that's also an issue for managers and senior managers that the gaps at different levels of management are becoming too big. And you've got a bit of a chasm between middle management and senior management that fewer and fewer people actually manage to breach. So it's the scale, I think, of the variation which causes problems rather than perhaps that we don't all earn the same. Okay, we'll maybe have a couple of questions from the audience. We're getting close to the end. Um, 
You mentioned the potential role of consumer power in helping to drive up the quality of work, and I'm sure many consumers would be willing to participate in that. But while there are high publicized occasional episodes of uh, misbehavior that we all know about, it can be quite difficult to know uh, which companies are doing well and which are not in that regard. How can consumer power be harnessed? You're absolutely correct. Um, sometimes it's very difficult to access that information. And sometimes there are few choices of alternatives. So if, if in the purchase of particular products, for example, you might find that no one um, business is better than any others. What we tend to see is the emergence of, of campaigning activity. So fair trade would have been one campaigning activity around the real living wage or real living hours, which is which is is the current um, focus of, of a lot of interest. It tends to be much more organised than than necessarily individuals doing their own thing. But I think there is, and and, and there's a, a limit to what individuals doing their own thing, how big a difference that can make. So I suppose we're really talking here about targeted consumer behaviour. There are real difficulties in that. But where we have a real um, significant element of low pay then access to cheaper food and cheaper clothes becomes really important. If we then penalise businesses that, that produce cheaper food and cheaper clothes on the basis of lower wages, then actually it becomes really difficult. It, it creates problems in that kind of full circuit of how people spend and earn their money. So, so there are, it's not, an, it's not a, I think, a, a solution in and of itself, but I think there is an obligation and I'm not saying I always, uh, I always adhere to an obligation on people with discretionary spend not to support poor work where they know that it's poor work. Sometimes you don't know, sometimes you realise afterwards, but where you know, you shouldn't do it. I had a conversation a few years ago in relation to the real living wage with quite a well-known business in Scotland that was not paying the real living wage to all of its employees. And my suggestion was, why don't you have two menus? Why don't you offer your customers an opportunity to pay a real living wage menu? And if people can't do that or won't do that, you have an existing menu. Now, it's a slightly quirky, and I was simply being provocative. It's a quirky thing to do. But as consumers, we, we, we do sometimes know how our, how our purchasing power is being spent. It's, this is not going to be comparable to the state spending money or large private organisations in their own supply chain, because we should be aware that the whole notion of conditionality on good and fair work doesn't just apply to the public sector. There are many businesses who, once they adopt, for example, the real living wage, institute that in their own supply chains. Those forces are far more powerful. Large organisations who improve their own supply chain's quality by adopting forms of conditionality. That's a really powerful lever. As consumers, I think we can do our bit. We can do more of a, more, have more of an impact when we're in organized campaigns and when we associate with other stakeholders in, who, who are interested in fair work. Okay, we've got time for one last question. Um, as always, more questioners than we have time. So thank you very much, Patricia, for your comments. Just to um, raise that in South Africa, they are requiring businesses to report the wage gap between the highest and lowest within their organization so that it's transparent to see that. And they are seeing that the bottom end is going up because the top end wants to go up and it needs to link that. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm struggling. Sorry, I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Sorry, my comment was that in South Africa, they're um, requiring businesses to report that wage gap and they're seeing quite a dramatic impact through that transparency that it's creating with businesses. My question is, um, how far do you think Edinburgh's decision to become a living wage space has consequences for the quality of jobs within Glasgow? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think we would need to look at the, the composition of the Edinburgh and Glasgow economies to get a sense of how much of a difference that will make. Um, as I said earlier, it, quite important parts of um, the third sector and parts of the private sector have already been lifted to the real living wage. So, for example, funding of social care in Scotland is funded at a labour cost equating to the real living wage. So that has picked up people across the country who provide social care services. Um, but I don't know how that will work out. There is 
I suppose behind your question, there is clearly at some levels of extrapolation an issue about where bad jobs go. So if you improve the quality of work in certain locations, do you then spread out poor quality work to somewhere else? Do we offshore poor quality work? Do we actually make it more difficult? And that's an argument which has been common when, you, when we discuss things like the gig economy. When we talk about the gig economy in the UK, we worry about it as being a problem, but actually for parts of the world, access to that economy, although it might be heavily exploitative, is an improvement on other employment, employment opportunities. So at some kind of existential level, uh, we do need to ask questions about how we can balance out commitments to um, our own citizens when it comes to the delivery of fair work alongside citizens elsewhere in the world. But you could extrapolate in terms of supply chains. You could say that businesses need to be encouraged not just to care about their own direct workers or their own immediate supply chain, but they have to think about what kind of consequences they have elsewhere. That's something that's come up in the sustainability debate when businesses think about their environmental footprint and take responsibility for the health and well-being and environmental impact of their broader supply chain. So, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. I don't know the answer to the, the Glasgow Edinburgh thing. Right. I think we've had, we've had a lot of questions, a lot of answers, and a lot of uh, thoughts. Um, I'd like to now ask um, the vote of thanks uh, to be given by um, Professor Lindsay Farmer, who's Professor of Law at Glasgow University, and is also the Vice President and is also the Vice President of Publications and Conferences for the British Academy. Thank you, thank you very much. So, first of all, um, on behalf of the British Academy, I'd like to thank uh, Patricia for a, an extremely interesting and stimulating talk. Um, exactly the kind of fresh thinking, the uh, engagement with social problems, uh, the bringing together um, academic uh, ideas and uh, reflecting on practical issues that are at the, the, the forefront of the kind of work that we do. Um, so thank you, Patricia, for the talk. Thank you for engaging with the questions, uh, even as it's getting uh, late in the evening. Uh, and, and thanks also, obviously, to the audience for, for coming out tonight and, and uh, for those who are listening on Zoom. I'd also uh, secondly like to thank the Royal Philosophical Society of Glasgow um, for organizing the event uh, and for partnering with the British Academy uh, in uh, hosting um, tonight's event. Uh, it's been wonderful uh, to, to be able to have such an event, to, to, to bring uh, people out on an evening, uh, a cold evening uh, like this uh, in March. And um, so, so, so thanks to you all for attending uh, on behalf of the British Academy.